it's one of the most underrated tuning shops of all time. Not only has it made some French cars extremely fast, it has won Le Mans, rallying, you name it, Alpine has probably done it. John Rodelle was almost destined to be in performance because the Rodelle family was born into speed. His father was the mechanic for the Renault factory team which won the Le Mans Grand Prix of 1906. John himself was an airplane pilot who went on to business school and became the youngest person to ever have a Renault dealer in France. The Renault dealer gave him access to the 4CV and he looked at it and thought it would do well at rallying. He tried to enter that year's Monte Carlo rally, but ran out of time because of the slow pace. Many would consider that a failure, except for the fact that he blew significantly more powerful Peugeots out of the water. And Renault management likes nothing more than blowing Peugeots out of the water, so he gave them the tools and the cash to create the 1063 Special. It was a 4CV, but it had bespoke bodywork and a new gearbox. This was a good investment, and it translated to a class win at the Mille Meglia, and another one 1954. His success in the French Alps led to John naming his racing division Alpine. And, well, if you're going to have a proper racing division with a proper name, you need a proper car. And the racing success meant he launched the entire racing team as a subsidiary under Renault in 1955 with their first car, the A106. 106 came from the reference number he used for the 4CV that he raced, but underneath it shared a lot of the components of that 4CV, including the rear engine, 747cc inline 4, making 43 horsepower, but if that was not enough for you, you could get a sporty version, 1959, with a two frame and a 904cc in line four, making 59 horsepower, yeah. Okay, it wasn't, but it weighed just 1,100 pounds, and it was a sales success that solidified the Alpine brand. The A106 was in fact used as a template for the A108 three years later. It still had the same 904cc engine, but the style was much more unique to the Alpine brand. I'm not going to say Alpine anymore, as fun as it is because that's just too much work. The A108 had a trick up its sleeve, though, for handling, and one that would be fundamental to Alpine's success. The new Beam and Backbone chassis, as it was nicknamed. This was started in 1958, and it was used all the way up till 1977. That is how good it was. But it was only started on the 108. It entered its element in 1961, when they launched their most famous model, the A110. Finally, the 4CV engine was replaced with a 1.1 liter, we actually can measure it in liters this time, inline 4, making 99 horsepower. And over the years, that was up to 140. And when combined with the aerodynamic body, you reach a top speed of up to 145 miles an hour in 1975. That is incredible for the gas crisis era. The A110 turned Alpine from making sporty cars into making sports cars. And if Gian rallied the 4CV, you bet he rallied the A110 brilliantly. You see, the A110 came just in time for the International Championship of Manufacturers when that was introduced to organize the rallying scene. And in 1970, when it was first launched, Alpine pounced on it. They won their first ever event at San Remo that same year, and from that point on, there was no stopping them. In 1971, they won five out of the nine rallies, including the famed Monte Carlo rally, and took the crown. And when the WRC was properly introduced in 1973, they entered the upgraded 
A110 into the 1800 Group 4 class. Combined with one of the lightest cars in the grid and 176 horsepower, it was a brilliant concoction. They won five events that year, including a complete podium sweep of the Monte Carlo Rally and the Tour de Corsa, two of the most prestigious French rallies you can find. They were so good that year, they won the first ever WRC Championship by a 63 point margin to second place. The same cannot be said about the years after, because the Italians arrived. Fiat swept the Monte Carlo podium in 1974 with the 1-2-4 at Barth, and then Lancia introduced the Stratos halfway through the season and ate everybody else for breakfast for the next three years. As a result of the Lancia's revolutionary purpose-built rally car, Alpine could only ever muster one second place finish for the remainder of their championship endeavors. They kept racing through the 70s, but never again seriously challenged for the title. Instead, they focus their efforts on other series, apart from the A series of sports cars. For instance, they powered a championship victory in the European Formula 2 championship in 1976, and at that same time built a test bed Formula 1 car for Renault, which they would use as a template for their F1 entry in 1977. They were a pretty good motorsport team. I mean, if you can enter Formula 1 successfully, that's not a bad thing. And having conquered rallying and Formula 2, Alpine turned their attention to the most important race in all of France. Le Mans. Their first attempt was the A442, which was first raced at the 1000 km of Mugello in 1975, and it took their first ever victory with this new technology called turbocharging. That would also be their only win for three years, as that turbocharging technology was not the most reliable thing in the world. And when you're competing at the 24 hours of Le Mans, you need reliability. But even if it was perfectly reliable, the Porsche 936 was utterly dominant and they didn't really stand a chance. But after a few years of failure in 1978, Renault was desperate for a win and gave Alpine a blank check. And what came out of that blank check was a lengthened, 520 horsepower, turbocharged version of the A442, called the A443. Woo! But, 520 horsepower, super aerodynamic, and it showed. During qualifying 1978, it blasted down the Mulsanne Straits at 236 miles an hour. That blank check also fixed their atrocious reliability, which meant after 30 years of non-stop DNFs, Renault Alpine won their first Le Mans outright with five laps to spare. And with an all-French victory in the bag at the most prestigious French race in the world, Renault called it mission accomplished and ran back to Formula 1. And since Renault's Formula 1 team was their factory team and not Alpine, Alpine just sort of went back to the road car business. First, there was the Renault 5 Alpine, which was one of the first hot hatches with striking graphics, 93 horsepower, and suspension set out to oversteer rather than traditional front wheel drive understeer. It was a great car. But speaking of great cars, the A110 was getting very old by the 1970s, so they entered a successor, the A310. What happened to the 210 with their previous naming systems? I don't know, but it's the A310. And to be honest, it wasn't really as good as the A110. The PRV V6 was too underpowered, and its rear engine positioning meant it had the dangerous handling characteristics of an old 911 without the same charm of an old 911. In fact, the only thing it had in common with the A110 and succeeded was its rally success. Yeah, it actually won the French Rally Championship in 1977. I did not know they entered rallying after the A110, but they did, at least on a national rally level, and they were pretty good, apparently. But regardless, the A310's lackluster performance compared to the A110 got Alpine sweating. So they launched the GTAs, Gran Turismo Alpine. And unlike the A310, this was a rear-engine masterpiece. The bodywork was fiberglass with pressure-injected polyester. This stiffened up the chassis and made the GTA one of the most aerodynamic cars in the world with a drag coefficient of just 0.28. And 
that is pretty damn good for 1984. And the PRV V6 still sort of sucked, but they redeemed themselves with the Turbo Cat Le Mans edition. What an awesome name, Turbo Cat Le Mans. Yeah. The turbochargers, when tweaked by French tuner Danielson, made 207 horsepower and 260 foot pounds of torque. It was the first road going Alpine to have a 0 to 60 time in under 6 seconds and have top speed in excess of 150 miles an hour. So, with the success of the GTA, they capitalized off it with the A610. And it was pretty much an even better version of the GTA. The 3 liter PRV V6 now made 250 horsepower, 260 torque, but even with a 163 mile an hour top speed, which is incredible for the car and the manufacturer that they were, sales were lacking, and pretty soon Alpine was beginning to fade away. By 1999, their facilities were used to build the weird Renault Spider thing, and then Renault shut them down altogether. And that was it. That was the entire story of Alpine. They started out rallying four CVs and ended producing a weird Renault Spider thing. Is what I wouldn't be saying if it was not for the fact that in the early 2010s things were rumbling at Renault. And Alpine came back and jumped right into Le Mans LMP2 with a partnership with Signatech in 2013. And it was a pretty good partnership, taking the European Le Mans title in 2013 and the FIA LMP2 title three times on the trot in 2016, 2019, and 2020. Well, wait, what about 2021, you're saying? Well, they partnered up with Rebellion and dialed it up a notch from LMP2 to LMP1, top tier, baby, for the first time since the 70s. The R13 was their effort for outright glory, and proceeded to get absolutely humiliated by Toyota. Oopsie. But they have a rebound plan in 2024 with their own LMDH car. No grandfathered LMP car for this one. In the meantime, though, you can watch them compete in the pinnacle of racing, Formula One. And I'll be honest, it's kind of a middle-of-the-road team mediocre, if I'm honest. They rebranded the Team Renault as Alpine F1 in 2021, and you know what, the rebrand must have done something, because they immediately proved their worth at the Hungarian Grand Prix. This was a duel for the ages. After a quick race restart, Hamilton went in the pits just on the fourth outlap, leaving Alpine's Esteban Ocon in the lead. But... Hamilton is in a Mercedes, and is Lewis Hamilton, and Esteban Ocon is Esteban Ocon in an Alpine. There's no way that he can win, right? Well, while everybody else moved out of the way to focus on their own races, one man did not move out of Hamilton's way. Fellow Alpine driver Fernando Alonso. Despite being in a dramatically slower car, the two-time champion held Hamilton off for 12 laps until a brake lockup finally allowed the Mercedes past. But by then it didn't matter. Alonso held Hamilton up long enough to give Ocon and Alpine their first Formula One victory. In fact, it was the first win for a Frenchman in a French car since 1983 in a dramatic season full of controversy, crashes, and excellent battles. This is one of the highlights. In fact, it might be the highlight. The battle between Hamilton and Alonso was truly titanic, and Alonso pulled off a hell of a job. Speaking of pulling off a hell of a job, Alpine brought the A110 back. It looks a little weird, I'm going to be honest, but it's a mid-engine, rear-wheel drive sports car, and it's a damn good handling one, too. How good handling? Gordon Murray used it as a reference for the handling feel of his T50 hypercar. That is high praise. Because he's the guy that made the MP4-4, the LCC Rocket, and the McLaren F1. And you, if you get the S model, you can get stiffer, lower springs, carbon ceramic brakes, a carbon fiber roof, and new Michelin Sport tires. And it had a 1.8 liter 4-cylinder turbo, 
making 288 horsepower. And it's the fastest accelerating Renault ever for the road, not mention Alpine, just Renault in general. 0 to 60 in 4.4 seconds. It's an amazing little machine. And yes, because it's an A110, it has a rally version from the FIA RGT class, which so far, in typical A110 fashion, has dominated the 2021 season against all competitors like the Fiat 124 Barth and the new 911 GT3. And unlike the highs of the 1990s that were great vehicle-wise but terrible sales-wise, it seems like Alpine is not going anywhere anytime soon. They're actually doing quite well. In fact, Alpine just partnered with Lotus to co-develop an electric sports car by 2025, so looks like they're in pretty good hands.